Uh, I lost my belt on go to meeting. There it is. <laughs> it's too much. Uh, thanks, Todd. So uh, we've got a fairly light agenda. I was uh, just just to sort of keep people informed. There is a another uh, proposal working its way through the sausage grinder, and I think one of the members is just looking to get through their internal clearances to contribute something and, and participate and so forth. So um, so we just have an action item review, work group updates, and then um, I thought we would use the remainder of the time to discuss the exit criteria that we seem to uh, have need for, uh, and not urgent, but we need to start having that conversation so that we have it clearly understood as to you know what we all feel is the criteria to exit incubation stage um, and what that all means. And so I think uh, when we have the time, we might as well take advantage of it and uh, and use the remainder of the time for that discussion. Pardon me, unless anybody has any specific additional agenda items to add. Hi, this is Brian Millendorf. I just joined and wanted to say hi and let folks know that I'm here and I'm following. Um, I just sent a message to technical discuss um, talking about my new role, um, and most importantly, I'm plan to stay out of your way <laughs> uh, as much as I can when it comes to technology issues. Um, but uh, I look forward to to being a partner with you all. Um, and uh, yeah, let's do this. Uh, great, Brian. Thank you, and and welcome aboard officially. This is good news. Yeah, I'm excited. Really excited. Um. And actually, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know you were going to be on. But I mean, is there, you know, would you like to say something, or because um, we, like I said, we do have the time. Uh, I, I didn't prepare anything. Um, oh, okay. I, you know, I, I, as I, I said in my email, you know, I've been following the project um, on the periphery uh, pretty closely and gotten to know many of you, and you know, it was, uh, uh, and also understand the goals and the they are, and, and feel like um, uh, there's a lot of Amazing opportunity here, uh, but it's also kind of on our shoulders, and especially the TSC shoulders, to shepherd this community um, and integrate the different contributions and um, and drive us towards what every community needs, which is shipping products, uh, and and that's what I think the world needs from Hyperledger too. Um, so uh, I won't be dictating <laughs> what what we build or where we go, but I will be nudging certainly um, in certain ways uh, and. Uh, Chris and I have talked a bunch about this, and I I do want to establish a relationship with each of you. So uh, I'll be reaching out, but also feel free to to get in touch with me directly, because um, uh, we we know this the not only there's potential here, but you know and what the opportunity is. And we also know it won't be realized until we really build a diverse, broad, um, productive, uh, open source software developer and contributor community around us. And so that's that's my goal. Um, and it's inspired largely by the the Apache Software Foundation's premise of great communities, focus on building great communities, and good high quality software will emerge as a natural byproduct. So uh, if there's any framing that I'm bringing to this, it, it's definitely that. So looking forward to working together. Great. Thanks, Brian. Okie doke. Let me. Okay, so um, action items. Uh, TSC representation policy draft. I <laughs> still need to do. My goodness, I'm such a bad boy. Um, I promise I'll I'll get that by uh, by next week's call. Um, uh, white paper draft. We can leave that, Dave, for the um, <clears throat> for the update since that's coming up right right next. Uh, the next action item was for Bishop, uh, who uh, reviewed a proposal last week to uh, contribute his busy work uh, uh, to the, the fabric. And uh, he was going to work with Ben and Sheen and Greg to get that uh, integrated. And uh, he told me this morning that the pull request is due to land uh, later today. So that I think we can take care of. Um, uh, Doodle polls for the June virtual hackathon and the July hackathon on the West Coast. Um, Todd, do you want to have an update on those? Or Yeah, so those went out um, 
when you have a second, please, please compute your availability. If those are events you're planning to attend, um, for the July hackathon, we're searching for space for that. I have a, a note out to a couple companies. Uh, also there's potential to host it at the Linux foundation facilities in San Francisco. Uh, so we'll just, uh, check what, what dates people are most available and then see what space matches up with that and be back in touch with an update, hopefully by next week, if not the week after, uh, I know one of the requests was to plan these further out than we have been. And so we're definitely making strides, uh, on that front. Excellent. And um, uh, just, uh, Todd, uh, you know, if, if, if we're having trouble, uh, we, I, I, IBM could probably host. I mean, that would mean either South San Jose or Foster City. Uh, those are two locations that we could potentially host it at. So that's, you know, South and South Bay, but um, uh, it, it's certainly uh, something we might consider. It's just a little bit more travel for people that are in the city. Um, and then finally, the exit criteria doodle poll. And again, I think given uh, Todd and I chatted yesterday, and given that uh, we have a, a fairly light agenda, we, we felt using the time here to do what we were trying to accomplish and getting some of the other TSC members together would uh, be well served. Um, so let's move on to the work group updates. So Oleg, are you on for the requirements? Yes, I'm here. I was on mute. Um, hi, good morning, everyone. Um, in the requirements for group, we're concentrating on uh, uh, developing the use cases that we have in our catalog. Um, I called for a, a better participation on the last meeting. Um, we now record uh, our progress on the dashboard page, but paste it in the chat. Um, I'm myself concentrating on financial <coughs> use cases. Um, I, did, uh, I just did the currency swap, and I'll have uh, interest rate swap and uh, um, equity contracts by Monday, um, by next Monday, where we meet and uh, discuss. So that's about it from us. All right, great. Any questions for Oleg? All right, thank you. Uh, Ram, you're up. And you're on mute. Or maybe, <laughs> maybe not. Architecture didn't meet this week. Uh, identity met this week. We're, we're basically alternating. Hi. Was on mute. Talk on mute Sorry, just uh, was uh, uh, just unmuted myself. Um, so um, not much of an update since we meet biweekly, and uh, you know our meeting is uh, next week, next Wednesday. Uh, so uh, I'll give you an update in uh, uh, next week's uh, thing based on uh, our uh, proceedings in the next meeting. Okay, thanks, Ron. Uh, next up is Dave. Dave O for uh, the white paper. Yeah. Um, hi, Chris. Thanks. Yeah, so we did, um, and, and Ram did attend uh, yesterday's meeting, so he was still working uh, on the white paper working group. Um, and uh, we did, if you take a look at the wiki under the white paper working group, you'll see that we have uh, updated the page to show that there is a white paper draft version 0 0.1 um, that's been published. And, um, and there's a link for the feedback form that we put out there as well. So. You know, we not everyone got to attend yesterday. A bunch of us were, were traveling, um, uh, and and so you know, we, it, it looks like everyone is sort of in sync. But we might be doing one or two more tweaks. Well, we'll definitely be doing one or two more tweaks to this draft version 0.1, um, probably today or tomorrow. But just to update some figures and things like that, uh, and some last-minute tweaks. But um, you know, the, the bulk of it is there and, you know, we, we would like people to, especially the TSC members, to take a look at it, read through it, um, and, you know, give us an opportunity to add a, any more edits before it goes in front of the, the board. Um, so looking forward to um, getting some uh, feedback through the feedback form there and, uh, and let us know what you guys think. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned, um, uh, when you if you look at it this morning, you'll see that a couple of the figures are, are still need a little bit of updating, but well, we should have that uh, straightened out in the next day or two. And that's it. Okay, 
Great. Thanks, Dave, and thanks to the, the, the others on the team. This is, uh, this is good work, and so I would definitely encourage people to review and provide your comments, and then um, what we can do next week is we can schedule a little bit of time to discuss any, any feedback or any, any concerns and so forth on, on the call. But, uh, Dave, Great. I really want to extend uh, thanks to, to you and the team. This is a good yeah, the team, team did most of the work. <laughs> I'm just an editor. They, they're the author. Um, so. Cat herding is very important. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, okay, where did my screen go? Um, uh, next up is Christopher, Identity. You guys met yesterday. Yeah, uh, thank you. So um, I just posted a, uh, a Google Doc link to the chat. Um, with sort of the minutes from the meeting. Um, the, uh, um, we had about 15 people show up, a uh, <clears throat> number of people. Uh, the original plan was uh, to talk about uh, and get a presentation on IBM's membership services, but that's been postponed probably for June 1st, but definitely by June 15th, which is our you know, next two meetings, uh, IBM will be presenting on the membership services team architecture for Fabric. Um, so instead, we ended up talking a lot about uh, other topics, uh, among which are um, uh, various kinds of, of you know, key life cycles, credential life cycles, how they're different for nodes and federations versus participants, some um, things around separating identifiers from claims. Um, uh, we definitely felt like there needed to be more um, stuff in the, in the requirements and in use cases around life cycles of identities. So we're going to be uh, uh, working on some documents to share with the requirements group and the architecture group around that. Um, in the areas of, you know, how, what happens uh, with inheritance. So, I mean, there's, there, there's a classic failure modes of, you know, revocation and, and things of that nature, but then there are certain kinds of things that need to be longer lasting. Um, inheritance is one. Uh, proper extinction, whether it is of an individual uh, group uh, identity, or a federation node. Uh, how does that? You know, how are things handled in that fashion? Um, uh, a variety of different kinds of, of discussions about tech, possible technologies that are you know being deployed elsewhere that um, have some real relevance. Uh, uh, the one that I think people really got kind of interested in and decided they would like to have a, a, a full session on is. To, to dive deeper into selective disclosure and some of the different uh, approaches to it. Um, the, uh, uh, and we closed mostly on, um, you know, the whole thing of is it, you know, is it possible, given that there are a lot of different choices in identity services and that not all uh, use cases um, are uh, sort of financial, um, uh, identity type of, of, uh, of use cases that we may need to have different um, identity services. So how can we define, you know, what exactly are those APIs for being able to have different kinds of identity services and uh, bindings and things of that nature. Um, and there was a little bit of a discussion around having a standard language around um, electronic and I didn't at the at that meeting have a final draft of um, uh, a paper that is now uh, published. Uh, let me quickly. Um, uh, sorry. Um, Dex, Dex, Dex. There it is, Dex. Okay, so uh, we talked briefly about this, but I didn't have the final version of the paper until today on uh, an example of a uh, a, a smarter uh, uh, smart signature um, technique that uh, could be useful for a variety of different blockchain uses. 
Um, so that's the beginning of, of that, and that's based on some smart signature stuff that is going on this weekend. I'll close the identity discussion uh, to say that you know tomorrow is the big UN conference on digital identity. Um, there's still a couple of uh, uh, spots open in the design workshop on the weekend, which is going to be at the Microsoft building. And if people are interested, there's more information at uh, uh, webofthrust.info um, if you're interested in participating. Uh, and we're going to be talking about a lot of these types of things. And again, two weeks meeting on the first, and then the one after that will be on the 15th. Chris, this is Jeremy Severide, if, if I might add. Um, we've come up with a list of, of a list of a number of different potential use cases that we're going to be reaching out to Oleg to try and see how it maps in. Um, but there's a one of the things from the past two discussions has been um, as we get a better sense of what the different dimensions of say the layers of the system might be or the separation between say the participants and the financial instruments or other traded items in the discussions it'll help to have a sort of a common language to as you said to separate out some of these things because I think in some of the discussions we end up uh, merging some some of them so I and think that'll be an yeah, there's definitely conflation in a variety of different areas. I mean, you know, some of it is different um, identity communities call, you know, key holders versus principals. You know, there's consumers versus relying parties. Um, and then there are other places where they actually use the same language but mean different things. So, you know, we've got to reconcile some of those. We need to have a better understanding uh, you know, like I feel like there's a fundamental difference between um, uh, financial uh, business workflows versus supply chain business workflows um, that may have large differences in how confidentiality is handled in them, and that can have some big impact on the on the identity system. So we need we need to have a, just a general you know better understanding of these problems. Um, I had a discussion this morning with uh, Bloomberg, Eric Anderson, and uh, he's uh, sharing with the Identity uh, Workshop this weekend a number of bi uh, uh, business cases that Bloomberg is willing to share. So hopefully we'll move some of those also over to um, the, uh, you know, the Hyperledger project if they're applicable. So, uh, um, you know, we, we need to make some progress here. So, <clears throat> thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. So, so just one sort of bit of <clears throat> uh, just just one bit of feedback here. I think it would be um, sort of useful to um, to to be sort of working along with the various use cases that are being developed to understand what the you know. Identity and various other. Um, oh, I mean, so that's why I've been real active in the requirements group, and unfortunately, we just haven't had the the critical mass uh, in the requirements group. We haven't had the right people, um, you know, and it's and and it just hasn't quite come together uh, yet. I mean, I made a I was at the Hyperledger meetup last night. Um, you know, there was a presentation that's you know listed you know, eight particular use cases that Hyper, that IBM is using Fabric for, and a couple of those cases they were, you know, able to say, you know, here is, you know, IBM's financial global services, and well, we yeah. need to get somebody from that team to help us write up their use case, because uh, clearly you're talking about it there. I think there are also some, some use cases that are in the identity paper that we really need to get the principles, but, you know, the feedback I've kind of gotten off offline is that you know the number of organizations are scared to participate in the requirements because they feel like they're under confidentiality uh, right. with their clients and thus can't do yeah. it and puts us in this yeah. catch I, 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 I hear you loud and clear and I agree and I've been sort of 
uh, to be honest. I'm, I'm trying to get those internal IBM use cases uh, out, you know, if they need to be anonymized or whatever, that's, that's fine. But uh, yeah, I've been working that end. Uh, but I would definitely encourage people to at least help us shape use cases, you know, you, you know, again, I mean, you can anonymize these things. You can make the discussion be about some other thing than maybe what you're exactly doing, um, as long as it satisfies describing essentially um, what the requirements are. Uh, and I'm more than willing if it's, you know, something along the lines where, you know, if it's really clear that, you know, your company is working with X, um, you know, you can, you know, you know, uh, Chris Ferris and I and other people can work with you to um, uh, to make it anonymous. So, um, uh, you know, please, <laughs> if you've got uh, some ability with that. I mean, I think if we have some more of those, we have a, a really good understanding of, of the fabric uh, architecture uh, for identity and, uh, and Intel presents, you know, help, helps us understand uh, their different approach to um, identity uh, for the sawtooth submission, I think we'll be in good shape to to proceed. Um, <clears throat> we'll make some real concrete, uh, um, uh, useful suggestions. So. Yeah, and and again, you can always, in, in addition to Chris and myself, uh, you you can also you know leverage Todd or uh, Philip. Uh, but anybody or Brian from the Linux Foundation, and if you want to submit a use case without it having any traceable <laughs> origins, that's another approach that you could take. And, and those guys obviously are—they're not—they're not trying to compete here. We're just trying to get uh, the project move forward. So uh, strongly encourage that. But thank, thanks, Chris, for the update. Let's see. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have the CI working group, and we've made uh, quite a bit of progress this week. Uh, we have, uh, Garrett has actually stood up. Um, uh, we have, obviously, we have to do a little bit more configuration and so forth, and we have to, I think, do a little bit of training, and then we have to do a, a planned migration over from GitHub to Garrett. But um, the, the service is, is up and running, so that's a good thing. Thank you, Rye, if you're on the call. Um, and then um, I also understand that Jenkins is up. But it still needs a couple of last, uh, uh, a last, uh, and a couple of last bit of configuration, um, and the individual who is doing that is uh, out on a, a personal, uh, a personal day, uh, the remainder of the week, and so I think that, pardon me, I think that'll be finished um, on Monday, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so hopefully, once certainly once we get Jenkins up and uh, and fully configured, then we can start the process of transitioning. Um, uh, for instance, the Sawtooth Lake team can start moving some of their own CI over to the Linux Foundation uh, Jenkins servers, and then uh, we can start in the Fabric team. Um, uh, we can start the, uh, the the transition from Travis to Jenkins. Um, and uh, would certainly welcome any of those of you who, the many of you who uh, offered to help with the CI, uh, now that we've got the services up and running, I think that uh, there will be plenty of opportunity for people to engage and contribute uh, as we, you know, migrate, uh, you know, the, the CI from Travis, for instance, there's some, you know, sort of rework of, of those scripts into uh, the right format for Jenkins, and then um, uh, there will be plenty of work to integrate, you know, Jenkins with Slack and 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 uh, and so forth. So uh, should be a lot of fun. Uh, and that's it. Unless anybody has any questions. Okay, hearing none. Let's hearing move. None. On. Let's move. Up. Is that me? I think that was an echo. Sorry, I, I heard something, and I think it's just an echo of my voice. Uh, so let's move on to um, exit criteria discussion. So I just pasted in a link in the chat um, to the uh, the channel in in the uh, in, in Slack where uh, we we started the discussion around exit criteria. 
um, almost a month ago, and uh, I think Chris and I and uh, and a couple of others had a, had a little bit back and forth on you know some some specific requirements, and so I'm just reminding people of that uh, particular chat. But I figured we could just start by sort of reiterating some of these points and. Um, I, I'd appreciate it if somebody could take notes. Um, can I get a volunteer for somebody just to take notes of this discussion? Uh, I mean, Todd, you're, you're taking notes obviously for the for the minutes, but are you able to sort of get a little bit of a detailed? Yep. Yep. No problem. And we're we're okay. recording the TSC call as well as always. Oh, that, that that's that's right. That's right. Great. So let, oh, that that should be fine then. Um, so let's just sort of do a, a recap of some of the things that I started to outline and, and, uh, and Chris and a couple of others, and I'll just sort of read them off. Um, and then we can, we can discuss, so I'll, I'll read off a few just to start with. Um, the first point that I noted was diversity of contribution. The project must demonstrate that it has um, cultivated a, a broad set of contributors from multiple members uh, and or non-members. And, and I, so I think, you know, that diversity is, is probably one of the most important uh, factors, right? We don't want to have, uh, I, I think, uh, I, I may be alone in this, but I, I think we probably want to make sure that whatever we're doing, it's, it's the, the membership that's involved and not just one. Um, I think also, maybe be a little bit more clear, I'm hoping for diversity at a couple of different levels. It isn't just necessarily contributions, but you know, companies that are, are using it or servicing it at various levels of the architecture. So you're saying that it's not just contribution, it's also usage? Well, we, we don't want to be in a situation where you know, the only party who can actually deploy it is one, is one party because there's some critical aspect of it that you know, only one you know, party can, can, um, can serve that. <laughs> and uh, okay, you know, well, I think that's, that's, a, that's a slightly different, yeah, that's, that's a different dimension though. So, that, so you're, you're talking that it needs to be, uh, uh, it needs to be something that anybody can use, is that what you're saying, or deploy? Now, I'm not sure that anybody is necessarily needs to be that high level, but you know, I mean, if if uh, you know somebody at DAH can deploy a fabric, and somebody at uh, IBM can de deploy fabric, and somebody at you know R3 can deploy fabric, that's a pretty good example of some some diversity, even though you know um, uh, small. Uh, vendor might not be able to because fabric may have some fairly high uh, requirements uh, at, at various points that you know they wouldn't necessarily have to. I mean, maybe, maybe we'll be able to do that. I'm not saying it does. I'm just saying that that at least there be some diversity of of you know companies that can deploy solutions um, is another form of diversity. Okay. I'm just going to type it into the Slack here as well. Um, thanks. I think that makes sense. Um, the next point that I had was test coverage. I said a project needs to demonstrate some threshold of test coverage um, to be considered mature. Um, and again, I think then, Chris, you had a, a comment. Well, you know, some parts are more important than others. It's probably more important that you have real solid coverage around some of the crypto stuff, and I think I agree with that. Um, and of course, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, you know, you know, the question of you know how much test coverage do I need can always be answered by more, right? So <laughs> I think you know it's just I think I think there needs to be some sort of a uh, a yardstick that that you know we we hold up. Um, it probably needs a sort of a minimum again because I don't think you know I, I think it's important that we understand when we talk about you know exit criteria from incubation into mature that that doesn't mean that it's done it just means that it's not incubating anymore right it means that we think we have something that we can actually um, be proud of and ship and that people could go off and deploy and, and use in, in anger as they say um, uh, and that doesn't mean that it's 
at its end, it means it's really at its, at its beginning because then you're going to add more tests, more function, more features, and so forth. Um, so I, I don't know what people think in terms of, you know, what's a reasonable sort of threshold of test coverage? You know, does it need to be 80% or um, something lower, something higher? Just get a... Yeah, it's, it's so hard to say because it's so different at different levels. Um... You know, the security things, you know, you want to be in the, you know, upper 90s. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, whereas, you know, business logic, um, uh, I mean, you know, the, I think the, the you know, typical error rates are in, you know, five lines per ten, per thousand uh, in this industry. Um, you know, Ethereum has got errors in 15 or 20 per ten, per thousand. <laughs> so, uh uh, I'm sorry, Ethereum uh, scripts, um, you know, have a much higher error rate. So um, it all depends. Um, any other thoughts? Hey, Chris, just a quick question. Um, this is Mick. Um, uh, when I opened up the Slack channel, it says that there's a bunch of older messages that have been dropped because we we're at our 10,000 message limit. Yeah, <laughs> I uh, see. That would be really bad because there's a bunch of other stuff on the other channels that we want archived. Uh, I see the beginning of the channel because I created it and I get the April 14th. Do you have back to April 14th? No. Um, and the message I get is your team has more than 10,000 messages in the archive. Um, so although there are older messages that are shown, you can't see them. Find out more about upgrading your team. <clears throat> Where is that? Sorry. Which channel? I'm opening the Slack. Yeah, I'm opening the Slack channel. Which which channel? Uh, exit criteria. Yeah, I saw that uh, in another channel. I don't remember which one. Uh, like yesterday, and was wondering why we weren't, um, you know, upgraded to the highest level of the nonprofit um, uh, Slack choices. Strange. Um, I see uh, all of this. But I, I see all of it too, so I'm I'm re I'm copying it. <laughs> uh, I don't get it. This is this is as much a question about Slack as it is about history. Yeah, uh, well, Slack is it, we're, we're getting it for free. I think uh, who was I chatting with? Was it Philip? Or maybe hey, it was Tom. this is a this this is Brian. Um, I think there's a conversation to be had about our modes of communication and collaboration and. Um, uh, that's a conversation I'd like to lead on the technical discuss mailing list. I've actually got a draft of an email already um, that just talks about our use of Slack, email, and conference calls. Um, didn't want to bring it up on this call because it's a longer conversation, and I actually wanted to use email to have this discussion as a way to validate that mode. Um, but uh, uh, part of it will be, you know, how we use Slack, and 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 that may influence decisions about, you know, um, do we do we decide to, to pay and go in, into that archive? I think there might even be a rationale that no matter what we decide regarding our use of Slack, it's worth um, either either having to pay or see if there's some exemption they may provide to us. I don't know if we qualify as, as a charitable uh, nonprofit in their eyes, but um, I, I'd have to ask. Uh, regardless, lots of other open source communities have had struggles with Slack um, on for this reason, for reasons that it's not indexed by Google, that sort of thing. So there's a longer conversation we had. Um, sorry to, not to provide clarity right now, but uh, I think perhaps uh, Todd and I can go off and research what it would take to um, uh, remove that restriction while we have this conversation in parallel. Thank you, Brian. All right, let me just see. And Chris, thanks for copying that stuff back into it. Yeah, I'm almost done, I think. Um, Wait, I just went to the exit criteria channel, and I, I only see back going uh, four or five uh, days, to, uh, back to April 21st, no, April 20th, before it says you can't yeah. just look any further. Um, your team has more than 10,000 messages. So although there are older messages and shown with low, you can't see them. Find more about upgrading your team. Right. We just we just went through that. So I just 
I just copied everything, so it's all there today. Um, I think. Thank you, sir. Um, so, so, Mick, did you have something to add to the um, to the to the last uh, discussion around uh, how we're rediscussing? Um, uh, no, no. I was actually I I just had remembered that I had made some comments on the channel. I wasn't seeing them, and I was just trying to make sure that I didn't <coughs> put them someplace else. So. Oh, you. Yeah, my comments uh, when we originally started the channel were around things like scalability and uh, um, appropriateness to requirements and things like that. Oh. Hmm. You copied some of them in there. Everything oh. from CMAKB. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is Jeremy Silverheim. I had a question. Is, um, given that running code wins, is there a risk in setting thresholds too high that uh, something else out there works and thus this effort is, or some particular incubation effort is lost? I think here's my, I mean, so I'm, I'm in this, you know, middle between kind of agile worlds and uh, crypto worlds. And I think, um, you know the the programming practices of this you know of the security world and in particular with crypto is very you know is very difficult to do in an agile fashion that being said there's some real value to agile for different aspects of things so when it comes to to some of the business logic and and things of that nature um, I don't know uh, that we need to have I mean I think we can do better than Ethereum somebody just did a review of you know like the top 50, uh, I don't remember the exact number, but, a, you know, a number of Ethereum smart contracts and was finding on the order of 15 serious errors per thousand, um, uh, and, you know, quoted, and I'm, you know, I'm not an expert on this one, around five, but, but whereas, you know, crypto work is at, you know, we're at like 99.5 with proofs uh, with some of our codes. So clearly, different places, different... Uh, different levels. Right, but the contracts, you know, for instance, or chain code or whatever, those, except for any samples, are, that's not really part of what we're doing here, right? So, um, obviously... Well, I agree with that. I mean, like, you know, it's, I'm not but, sure that, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the uh, I, I'm fairly confident, for instance, that a lot of the identity stuff has to be strong. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, we, you know, we need to have a crypt, you know, IBM's proposing a new cryptographic technique. It's not radically new. It's not like a whole new crypto system or everything, but they're creating, they're creating derivative, um, uh, keys in a, in a new form and using them, uh, you know, there, that hasn't been published yet. We need to, you know, to get some, some cryptographic review of that. There, you know, a few, a few things like that we absolutely have to do, but I'm, I'm, I don't know that, uh, you know, we have to have it all the way to the, uh, that every layer of it needs to be to that extreme. It'd be nice, but, you know, <laughs> but I do believe there are some specific spots we need to be very careful with. Okay. Hey, okay. <coughs> hey, Chris, this is Morali from DDCC. Hey. For uh, hey, for you know, we are new to this exit criteria discussion. Is there a document or some bullet points? I mean, we seem to be jumping, but is there a is there a document uh, no, that no that document we can, okay. just uh, what we had been previously discussing in chat and uh, in Slack rather, and uh, I've I've pasted it, the the exit criteria. Um, I pasted all of the, the previous chat into today, so I'll just send a link. Um, into the to the Slack discussion for today. Yeah, I mean if you go in the Slack, we can't see any history there, right? No, so, we just discussed that Morali. It's yeah. <laughs> I just pasted everything today. You have to be able to see today. Okay, okay. Is it okay, sorry about it, that, Chris? Um, okay, so let's let's move on. So full reviews of security and cryptography was, uh, Chris, I think that was your point. 
Uh, I think we've pretty much beaten that horse to death. I think everybody agrees. Um, some form. Uh, you, you also had the comment, Christopher, of some form of real-world pilot. Um, you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. So I think there's a, a big difference between uh, a proof of concept, you know, with play money and and uh, you know small scaling or whatever, versus some kind of pilot where you know there are real people uh, using it that are you know outside your company or it's being used for some you know small um, uh, purpose. So you know I. I you know, and there's ranges in there. I mean, I think, I mean, I like what um, I heard from um, uh, Interledger about, you know, they did this game prototype uh, with the Interledger thing and all the lessons that they learned from, you know, having 3,000 people, uh, you know, use it um, uh, was valuable, but I, I consider that to be still a a proof of concept, um, you know, the, that particular game is over the, the quasi tokens that they exchanged and, and traded, you know, have no, uh, had no value nor, you know, real thing, whereas, you know, a small supply chain or, you know, a, uh, uh, you know, something that is, is real <laughs> uh, in some fashion is, you um, uh, I would like to see as a criteria for mature, which is why I had been suggesting there needed to be something between mature and, and incubation to start off with. Mature um, is a pretty well, strong... Well, I, I guess, I guess it depends on... That. I'm sorry. Super mature or production grade, GA, I mean, I think, you know, <laughs> again, uh, you know, from my perspective, incubation should be about getting the project to a uh, a cadence of maturity, you know, where they're they're doing testing. It's not like they've just omitted that completely. The CI process is in place. You know, the re, you know the release process is in place. I, I agree that there need to be gradations, but I think that's a form of release. Right? We can have a a beta release, or we can have a you know a one dot o or a three dot o. If you know three dot o means you know we're really sure this time, you know. <laughs> but I I. I, I I understand. Well, there are I think, ways I think you're reading into incubation a lot more than that really needs to be there or should be. There. It, it, the signal of mature, though, is that somebody who maybe has a little bit less knowledge um, uh, can begin to, you know, make a do a contract with somebody, and uh, um, you know, right? Isn't that, you know, isn't that in a, a statement that we said, oh, it's mature enough that you can rely on it in some fashion? So we should. I, I think. I think we're talking about. I, I think, Christopher. I think we're talking about different things. Because okay. when I think of incubation and maturity, I'm really thinking more along the lines of, you know, do we, uh, you, you know, ha have we, uh, have we agreed that this thing is something that we're going to continue to support and nurture and, and so forth and. From my perspective, nobody's going to go and use an incubating project in anger, uh, you know, because they're going to say, "Well, it's still incubating, right?" I mean, I mean, well, again, you, they're and I'm going to, to let the, the technical steering committee and the board make some decisions about that aspect. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, Mike, I've said my piece. This is Mike Dolan. Uh, normally, our projects at the foundation, when I think maybe the difference in what you're both saying is the anchor point in terms of what you're referencing to. Uh, incubation and maturity usually references uh, a project's participation or a module's uh, in, uh, use in a final release of the code base, not not in terms of maturity or use in production environments, many of which we may not even know about. Um, it, it, putting incubation on a module is like calling it beta, and nobody's going to deploy that anyways. Um, but when you're talking about it in an open source project, in terms of graduation, it's usually has this project or this module proven capable of participating in releases. Does it have uh, people watching for bug fixes and maintaining security patches and 
uh, continuing active development of it are, are normally the, the criteria you're looking at when you move from something that's being incubated into uh, a mature state. You can look at the Apache incubator for other uh, examples of how other open source foundations do this, but it's the Apache incubator does not at all, you know, require, you know, implementations or proof of production use. Um, that That's getting into a very difficult place for a project okay. to, so to go. I, I can buy that, but I, I'm hoping that anybody who has anything that does at least what Sawtooth did, um, I don't know if Mix here, but I mean, they learned a lot from, you know, uh, a three-month, uh, th you know, 3,000-some-odd people, right, Mick? Um, uh, it wasn't that big. It was, you know, we had, but we've had um, real deployments um, that are put out there, which has been incredibly useful and in, um, sort of tickling out the, the uh, uh, you know, I'll say we come at this from kind of an academic that the real problems are consensus and chain code, but um, they tend to not be the real problems. The real problems are, you know, does your does your code fit into whatever regulatory environment it's operating in? Um, and and uh, just one observation on that: um, for systems like this that are related or that are very closely related to multi-organization deployment, um, uh, whether or not there's a real application, um, I would suggest that it would be extremely useful to have something like running systems that we can all poke at, um, would it be possible to incorporate into this process some notion of having test ledgers perpetually available that are running um, uh, uh, some particular branch out of the out of the repository at some point in time? And that also becomes, it becomes a less rigorous demonstration of maturity, but it does demonstrate a completeness and a maturity. Yeah, but uh, all, all open source projects go through a refinement period after, you know, there is a release. People do start to put it in production. People learn things about it. And that's why you want uh, a, prog a project that, that, that moves from incubation to mature should have people ready, willing, able to work on that feedback from people who are I, putting it into production. And, I don't and, think and we're disagreeing with you. Yeah, okay. I'm, my my question, Mike, is is that this is this is not um, these ledgers are not things that we have to, that we can treat like a library or a separate service package, um, because one of their characteristics is one of the unique characteristics of this domain is that it's a cross autonomous organization um, service, um, and so it does have some unique requirements that we have to that we have to consider. Um, uh, we can incubate DNS bind um, and understand how that operates as a package, but understanding how it operates in the entire DNS system is critical to really understanding how it works. So I think I, I, I agree with you. You know, if we're talking about something like um, like an Apache server, right. um, it's a single stand-up entity that a single organization can run that way. Um, these ledgers aren't. Right. I mean, they they go beyond that to multi-organization kind of characteristics, and 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 I feel like we're not um, addressed. And by the way, this is there's a big question mark at the end of this, which is how do we do this? Um, I'm not specifically proposing um, uh, an idea. I'm just throwing ideas out. Um, I, I have worked on other projects that were federated services like this. Um, and we had a continuously running open source projects that were um, had continuously running test beds um, as a means of verifying um, <coughs> cross organization consistency. Yeah, and, and that's how our other projects who have a federated you know dependency model that that's how they do it. They they do you know a test bed where they can just continuously running you know testing against the code base. I mean, that's, so that's, I was just suggesting that that one level of, of one characteristic might be that it must work in whatever that sort of test bed criteria are, whatever, yeah, however it, we define that. And that is a common exit criteria. Yeah, yeah. that makes perfect. It's it's not a, it's not a full blown production system, but we do have some sort of minimal liveness that tests the cross organization characteristics. Okay, maybe I misunderstood some of the comments earlier about um, you know the intention there in terms of. But you know that that is that is very common. 
Uh, this is Jeremy Severed. I was going to suggest that um, others, because of the nature of the kinds of transactions they want to put on the on these blockchains, may need to know whether or not it's uh, transaction ready. So it, it may be valuable to say, you know, has this been audited? Has this been blessed by the security crypto community? Has this been used? Used and approved by a, a, a regulator, if if that's known, just so people, uh, just so there's at least enough disclaimers there, that somebody somebody doesn't go and say, oh, I th I thought this was meant for ready for this. Hey, um, uh, hey, Chris, this is Morali. I think. Documentation-wise, I didn't see a mention of documentation. I think there should be sufficient documentation for anybody, um, you know, anybody trying to deploy or test the test any of these incubation projects. For the, you know, that should have enough documentation, yep. right? Which illustrate the test cases, which you know. Which demonstrate, you know, the, from from deployment to the testing of of the various use cases. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> um, other thoughts. Uh, um, just a process question on this. Um, are we are we going to capture all of these into a into a separate white paper? Is that the intent, Chris? Yeah, I'll I'll use the notes that I'm taking in Slack as well as whatever Todd has recorded, and uh, I'll listen to the recording again, and I'll put I'll I'll put all that into some sort of a uh, a Google Doc or something that we can bang on. So, okay, so and 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 again, this is this might be a question for Mike and and Todd. Um, uh, my understanding, when Chris, when you were describing your characteristics of maturity, it's maturity within the context of the hyperledger organization, as opposed to code maturity relative to production quality. Did I understand you correctly? Yes. So I had, um, you know, there were two things that weren't discussed um, that I find interesting. So. You know, one of which, um, you know, there was uh, no requirement that a uh, mature release have any kind of pluggable architecture or support multiple consensus algorithms or um, multiple identity systems or whatever. Um, I also didn't hear anything about that uh, Hyperledger would only have one code base, and that future, you know, prod, future stations moved into maturity had to reconcile with existing ones that were already in maturity. Um, is is the, are both those statements true, or if, you know, explicitly those are not part of the maturity criteria? So, I, I I would look at that as more of a function of you know you're you're talking specifically about um, an, an implementation set of capabilities, and it's not clear to me that that's again as as you know Mick I think clearly teased out um, you know what I was referring to in talking about this is from a hyperledger perspective is the project mature in terms of its um, uh, in terms of uh, the, you know, uh, sorry, Mick. I'm, I'm. Uh, you know, is the is the project Go mature from a process perspective along the dimension yeah. of the ledger project? I, Not, I just want to make yeah, sure that, that was what I was. That was the differentiation yeah. I was making. Thank you. So I just want to make sure we're, we're we are kind of saying that you know whether or not say. Um, uh, uh, whether or not 
um, fabric is pluggable or not is not something we're really concerned about for until get to mature and and we're not really concerned about say Intel let's say say fabric is goes mature first that we also don't have a requirement that you know Intel also uh, now has to you know be compatible with fabric in for, in order for it to go mature so those in, in a sense we're not holding either of those as gates. No, and again, you know, I've, I've, as I've said a number of times, I'm very keen on trying to figure out how we collectively as a community can, you know, get from a place where we are necessarily battling over one versus the other and think about this more as a, as a whole. Um, I mean, that's why I want a public pluggable architecture, but that seems to be not where we're we're ready to talk about. Yeah, it. but I think again, this is uh, this is less of a um, this is a less you know. The, I, I think again, when we talk about incubation, as Mike said, as Mick has you know sort of called out, this is much more of a function of are we behaving in the way that we hope from a from the rest of the project's perspective that you know we you know, that we have a diversity of contributors, that we're writing test cases, that we're writing documentation, that, you know, we, we've got a release process in place and it's consistent with what the others are and so forth. Um, I think that, you know, it'll take some time for us to do things like align on APIs and SPIs and so forth. I, that would be, you know, uh, you know, for me, that would be a wonderful thing if we could do that if we are to have multiple implementations, you know, or uh, you know, or if we're going to try and get to one, and we can have pluggable componentry, that would also be fine. I mean, but I, I, I'm not trying to say I, I'm, and I'm expressly not trying to say, you know. But um, I think we, we need to figure out how we're going to achieve that. I think that's really what this discussion is about. I, I know we're coming up short on time, and, and maybe this is another conversation to continue on the list. But uh, um, I think this, this could be could be right for revisiting, just because there may be a confusion between, um, and, and and acceptably so, and beyond the the people on this call um, on uh, you know the, the the maturity model we're going for here, you know, and, and what incubation means both from a community perspective and from a code perspective, because I think. There is a very useful function to being able to telegraph to the outside world when we think code is ready for production. When we think, you know, here's a set of APIs that are stable that you can build against, or here's a protocol that you know you can uh, depend reliably depend upon, not messing up your your federated network with. Um, so uh, I I I think. Uh, I think we should also be focused on the long term, which is in the long term, there's a collection of projects underneath the Hyperledger banner um, at different stages of recommendation for production use. Uh, um, and, and But ultimately, things that might start out as contributions from one vendor or contributions from one source. I know Ethereum is interested in tossing over their, their C++ client as well. Um, you know, rather than the thinking of these as contrib contributions that then sit there like a collection of Object they are uh, they are <laughs> um, instead they are the the the, the seed for um, uh, something that becomes a hyperledger identity kind of kind of product right and what what do we want uh, to to put a 1.0 on what do we want to label production quality and recommend it right um, I think these are larger conversations than than we're likely to arrive at in the negative one minute that we have remaining. Um, uh, and so, yeah, but, but we could punt for the next call or, or, or have publicly, but I think we should be open to, to revisiting. We are at the top of the hour, but we do actually do have a half an hour remaining, but I think, um, yeah, maybe that we all have to sort of go back and, and, and think about this a little bit in, in light of the conversations we've been having and uh, and maybe, you know, having something actually written down would maybe give people a little bit more to chew on and, and to respond to. So I'll take an action to, uh, you know, once the, the minutes are published to, to synthesize that. I'll read, uh, I'll uh, listen again to the, to the discussion and 
see if anything was missed, but I'll try and pull together a Google Doc that starts to, to put something together that we can then all uh, start working from. So, um, unless there's any other issues, I guess we can give people some time back. I can check out in my hotel. <laughs> Uh, Bill, if you've got notes from the discussion, that would be wonderful. Um, you can send them to the Hyperledger uh, uh, TSC list. Alice, if you go to the uh, hyperledger.org slash, um, what is it, community, I think it is, uh, uh, we, all the, the link to the mailing list uh, archives and so forth is there, as well as to Slack and, and others. Okay. All right. Uh, well, thanks, everyone, and thanks, Brian, and congrats on the, the new role, and look forward to working with you more. And we'll see you all, all next time. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris.